inspirational and find some sort of like hope in that story. I feel like all of us come from different backgrounds and if we feel very comfortable just being open and being vulnerable, especially to crowds of millions or just to one person, um, we go through what we go through for a reason. So. Let's get right into it. I have a list of questions to ask you. Um, the first one is for the Hope Speaks podcast here. I typically like the idea of the podcast is to simply bring on people that are either writers, directors, actors, musicians, uh, everybody in the creative genre, just to talk a little bit about their lives and what inspired them to start. So I guess my first question to you is what inspired you to start acting? Oh, gosh. When I was nine i wanted to start acting i remember watching the academy awards like that was like a huge event in like my younger childhood with my whole family we were we would just watch it together and i don't know i distinctly remember one year and i forget what year it was but um <clears throat> there was an in memoriam segment of that show of that event um and I remember it was hosted by uh, uh, Sigourney Weaver. And just watching that with the music in the background and just seeing all the faces of people who had passed away in the past year and just like the influence that they had on, you know, the industry as a whole. I remember that sticking with me very, like, I even remember what dress Sigourney, it was like this, this red dress and it just stuck with me since I was nine. You know, I've, I've always wanted to be a part of this industry, but, you know, you grow older and it's like you hear all these things left and right about how dangerous and how dark it can be. And um, you start learning things that you didn't care to learn about when you were younger or that age. But, um, yeah, when I was nine years old. I remember just watching the Academy Awards. Every, everything with film and art is very magical. Like it has that magical moments. And I, I, what I want to tie, I guess, with what I get from you is like the legacy, watching people on screen and the legacy they left behind. Mm -hmm. So, which, of course, this is probably a better question for the end of the podcast, but what kind, <laughs> okay. of legacy, what kind of legacy would you like to leave if you're OK? Because say you're at the say you made it big, the Academy Awards, and for some odd, for some reason you had passed away, but your pictures up on screen. What mm -hmm. would you like people to remember you by at the end of your acting days or at the end of your life? You'd think I'd have like a solid answer to that. Like you'd think that anybody would have like a solid answer to that. What, well, what we're kind still of we're still young, and we don't you know we haven't figured that out that part out yet. But I mean, you know that, that it is a harder question. Um, I think, to be honest, it's it's. Whenever I think about it, I I just want to first and foremost represent somebody who is a light in this world i mean i i just want there to be like when somebody thinks of me they think of like positivity they think of joy um even if they don't necessarily think of like a follower of christ or like a just a godly good man who cared about his family and cared about people who couldn't necessarily take care of themselves and yes there's a lot to do in film but also there's such a platform to be had and so much you can do with that platform that i would like to do or use one day to just make this world better even if it's entertaining somebody for two and a half hours in the movie theater <laughs> No, I mean, and, and I think in today's day and age, escapism in films is something we really need. It seems like Agreed. we either go more political or religious anymore, but escapism, like the whole idea was, mm. you know, I, I would go to the movie theater as a kid and I still do. I always like to watch, if I ever go twice to see a movie, it's really good. If I go three times, it's, it's amazing. Uh, but the, first time I tried <laughs> to go, the first time I tried to go sit as an audience member, the second time I go for like more critiquing, trying to work on the directing aspect, which is mine. Um, but I, I do feel, I do feel that sentiment. I feel like as long as we can entertain people, you know, whether it's actors or directors, I think that that's the main goal and that should always be the goal. Um, and do you ever take that into your own films when you're picking like a script? I don't know the whole process for you because of course you're getting, <laughs> you're getting casted. I'm the one that typically casts people. So a, how do you get most of your roles? Are they through friends or do you read the script? Have you rejected scripts? Like, where's that process and where's your mindset? Like, do you accept certain films compared to others or do you not care about the genre? I got to 
<clears throat> that is a loaded question. I apologize. It's really not a loaded question. I just, I feel like, let me, for anybody listening or watching this podcast, and even for you, and we really just met, you and I, um, I have very, very humble background. I mean, currently I'm bartending in downtown Orlando. Um, and have been doing that for four years and been in the service industry for about seven and a half. Um, I was trying to get into this industry like at the age of maybe 13. Uh, had like a manager and an agent <clears throat> and was going down to Miami. I, I was raised in West Palm. So it was like a hop, skip and a jump to just like kind of dip my toe into that market. But for somebody with my look, that market wasn't very, um, uh, you just kind of felt like a very small fish in a very big sea. Um, I hadn't done anything for a year. I had studied film at uh, Palm Beach Atlantic for two years, and then I stopped because I couldn't afford to go anymore. Um, and then after that, I kind of just threw myself into work. I was like, oh my gosh, so this is what it's like to make money. <laughs> I was like, let's do it. So uh, working full time, I kind of just let go of that, but held on to you know, the passion for acting and wanting to do it eventually. But I always told my mom, I was like, you know what, mom, I got to do what I need to do in order to do what I want to do. So she instilled that in me at a very, very young age. But I haven't done, I hadn't done anything for 10 years, like at, at least nine, 10 years. And then um, I get like this advertisement. I live right across the street from Full Sail, which is cool. So that means I live right across the street from most of the students who are directing and writing scripts and holding auditions consistently just for a grade. Um, and I remember seeing the ad for Chase's film, uh, and it, I was like, okay, well, I remember I was laying there on my phone, like, okay, sure. Let's just submit an email. Didn't really have a proper headshot or a resume that was worth looking at, uh, did it. And then got the lead out of the grace of God. And I was like, yo, this is awesome. So it was really the first thing that I had done in like nine and a half years. And the first thing that I auditioned for, I wanted leading a film with Chase. And I got to be introduced to, you know, the crew and essentially other students. Have a great day. Oh, thanks, Google. That's very nice <laughs> of you. Um, but I got to meet a lot of the crew and the students that go to Full Sail and, um, gratefully just through bonding both on and off set and hanging out and having little nights where drink and play cards they have come up to me and said hey you know I, I have this film or I have this script that I'm working on it's short and you may not get paid for it but would you like to be a part of it in my mind I'm like yeah right now it's not about getting paid it's about building a reel so I'm not rejecting really any scripts unless they conflict really with what Chase is doing because he kind of gave me a little start and pushed my, uh, I guess you could say he jump started that passion that I had when I was like 19 or, or nine. <laughs> so that's uh, my little process right now when it comes to picking scripts. I don't, it's not based on really anything particular. I'm just, honored that they even consider me to help out <laughs> well i gotta tell you and i know that this is coming up later in the podcast because i have to talk about soldier's blessing uh now i have seen the film and by the way you were incredible awesome. so honored <laughs> just just Thank letting you. you know you were incredible in that film and i would always and like i talked to chase and like i, I throw out chase ideas every now and then for my <laughs> own films and you know if i could ever bring you up to pennsylvania or whatever i'll try to get you up here bud just for one night right. because i have quite a few ideas that i'm throwing around but um, let's go, and I know this doesn't, this isn't a popular thing, but I think to bring us into the light with all the other films is I want to hit a little bit of that darkness first. So when you're out of that passion, those career for about those nine, 10 years, um, did you still feel supported? Was your family like, because a lot of people that I bring on musician wise, especially musicians, like they're like, hey, my dad really influenced me. My mom influenced me because they were musicians. Did anybody ever do acting in your family? Did anybody do anything with cinema or music or were you the first? And did they have your support behind that? I, uh, my mom really was the one that like, even to this day, she's like, 
you know, you need to sing something, you need to put something out there, like on the internet, you know, you, you just got to put your, your talents out there and keep, keep, my mom is the biggest supporter, like, not to be dramatic or anything, but she consistently says, you know, I see you on that stage accepting an Academy Award, like, I know you're going to get it. She, she wants me to affirm and validate that for myself. Like, she's the one where it's like, you know what, faith faith is a substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen it's going to happen speak it into existence so she is always every single time i say hey it would be so cool to be in a movie she's like you're going to be in a movie um so my mom definitely my sister when i was like really <laughs> we went to this uh, pottery pottery place and the first thing she made me was this little statuette which i still have it's well, it's in my closet, but this little statuette of um, <laughs> an Oscar. She painted it herself and she wrote Bubba. Um, my family has really always been like incredibly supportive to a fault. You know, it's, it's sometimes I think they're blind to the reality of the industry, but I know that's not true. I just, I've, I'm so grateful. My father, um, I think my father was just concerned when I was younger and even to this day, like, you know, make sure you make decisions that are beneficial for you in the long run. And, you know, the industry is very questionable when it comes to like financial, um, uh, making an income. <laughs> so I think that was his main concern was just making sure that I made a good decision for myself, um, where I'd be financially stable. doesn't mean he didn't support me. It just means that he, you know, didn't want me to make the same mistakes that he did when he was younger, if that makes sense. So to answer your question, yes. I have no, it does. And, and, star and starving artists have been a terminology used for years. That part. Um, so <laughs> um, I guess, the, I guess the light of that is whether it's you or me, you know, and we, we, I don't exactly have the most upstanding career right now. There's a lot more things I would love to be doing in the area, but of course, you know, oh, all of us, Florida, though, I feel is a lot better place to have a start than PA right now. I need to get out of PA in order to try to make more connections. But um, I'm glad that you have that support. And for people that don't Thank have you. that, for people that don't have that support, um, you know, like if if we both had to talk to them right now, for the people that didn't have support, and if we had to talk to people that really are young, naive, maybe even like coming out of high school or in high school, that like, hey, once we get out of high school, you know, I'm going to be a film star. I'm going to win an Oscar with before I'm even 20 or whatever. Um, the reality of that is most likely you are not going to do that. But mm. if you can talk to either your younger self or talk to somebody that's listening right now, that's young, that's wants to go into this business, uh, give us a little bit of background. I know you already did, but give us a little bit more insight on how hard it really is or like your mental mindset of how hard it is to get to where you want to be. Want to be there. Be pa Like people say, yeah, passion isn't enough but i mean in reality if you are passionate about something it will motivate you to work for it i mean i think the biggest thing i needed to to really grasp when i was younger and even to this day and i'm still going to have to learn this when i'm like 40 is always always have a plan start with baby steps I mean, if something so grand and so grand in your life seems unreachable, quit thinking like that. Think of the baby steps that you need to take to move at least in a general direction towards that. You know, have faith, yeah, but take little baby steps. It's okay to take little baby steps. It's okay to crawl before you walk, before you run. Um, but uh, yeah. Passion really is enough. Stay passionate about what you're passionate about. And um, I think the worst feeling in the world is feeling stagnant. You know, at least if you're moving and you're working towards something, at least you're working towards something. At least you're moving. Whether or not you gain momentum takes time, and God's timing is perfect. Whether you believe in God or not, passion really is enough. So stay passionate. You know, don't let anything deter you. So, so I, I'm assuming you believe in God, correct? I do. Okay. I do. Um, 
take us through, and I know, of course, this is a, this is a Christian channel, but I don't like to go super, super religious sometimes because I <laughs> that can deter people away. But mm. um, as far as your faith, because you talk a lot about faith, like whether it's in filmmaking and passion and, you know, your early life and even throughout that nine, 10 year gap that you really felt like you weren't getting involved with in the arts enough. You didn't really get too many gigs, but you were like, OK, I need to hit the workforce. Um, when did when was your faith at your biggest? When was my faith at my biggest? It's <clears throat> an interesting question. When, so I guess, I guess, let me ask first before you, before maybe because this will spark maybe the, the highest point of faith, but when was your lowest point of faith first? Mm. Um, hmm. I'll give you, I feel like me answering these questions has led to like very, very <laughs> long answers to a very not supposed to be long answered question. <laughs> uh, but they're any, but they're entertaining and they're also informative <laughs> at the same time. So, you know, that's always good. To give you a small background. Um, so my father has been uh, absent from my life for about I want to say like 14, 15 years. Uh, my dad was involved in a legal battle that prior to him being put in prison, which is where he is now, um, had led to about 10 years of my life and my sister and my mom going through court dates and house arrest and yada, yada, yada. And all of it involved, <clears throat> all of it kind of involved the uh, pastor of the first church I was ever taken to when I was a child. Um, uh, there was a dispute about where money had gone. My dad was placed in charge of, you know, the books during a land transaction where the church was trying to expand. And um, there was a dispute about it. And uh, it kind of, that's, that's what led to, you know, all these court dates and yada, yada, yada. But, um, you know, I remember the night that, you know, my dad was actually taken to prison. I had to go to school the next morning and I was so young and I didn't really understand what was going on. And I just remember running upstairs <clears throat> because it was the, it was the last night that he was able to provide some sort of, I guess, I, from what I remember, like collateral, um, you know, just to finalize everything. And, uh, hopefully dismiss the case after like seven to 10 years of court dates. But I remember running upstairs and just praying and like saying like, God, please, you know, don't, don't let my dad be placed in prison. Cause I knew how long he was going to be in there, uh, but it didn't happen. And he was taken the next morning while I was at school. And uh, I think he has about five more years uh, left. I mean, we've made it this long. He's made it this long. But that was probably when my faith was at my lowest, <laughs> was when I was just that young. But as I grew older, to be honest with you, it's you learn that everything really does happen for a reason. There is a divine plan, I believe, in my heart. 1000% that there is a divine plan for everything that happens. I mean, my dad became a much better person in prison, ironically. Uh, my view of the church is so different than most people my age, simply because of the experiences I had with, with my dad and this, this church. Like, it's so funny. I tell people all the time, I'm like, I have more church in a bar parking lot or in a dorm room that I had in four walls that I went to every Sunday. I just, I think out of my lowest point of faith when I was younger grew a man who I hope and believe is a very, very strong faith. So that is my long answer to answer your uh, very short question. <laughs> no, I mean, that was, that was, inspirational in so many ways and I, I could I could see the look on your face too like when you're explaining all this and and I didn't mean to make you uncomfortable but I but that was no, no, no. I think a, a lot of people though listening right now can a relate to or b you know understand through different situations and quite I frankly so. I mean, it, it just shows 
your faith. And I, you, you mentioned one thing too, that just sticks out to me when you said that you had more church in, in bars than you've had in church. That speaks a lot to the Christian community. Okay. And I know that a lot of Christians are viewed as hypocritical and listen, we broke away from our previous church that we went to. I had grown up in a church for 22 years, this one church. And mm. of course I didn't really go through youth group and stuff like that, but I was still like a member of the church. We didn't really have a good yeah. pastor for like my youth period. Um, but okay. so I was going to different churches, but like still maintain this church. And, you know, since then we haven't been back to that church. We've been to all different sorts of churches and stuff like that. And I do a lot of videoing for, for church, for different right. local churches, but like, it just speaks to, because you look around the congregation, it's like, everybody's like, yeah, okay, praise the Lord. But then they turn around and they're like, Hey, we're not praising the Lord, you know, when they're out in public, you know, and, and one of the lines too, and I, and I, I can't get it right from the quoting of the Bible. I'm not going to, I can't make it word for word, but I know it <laughs> I know it simply talks about Jesus going to the places and there's stories of Jesus going to the places to be with the sinners when people are like, Hey, you know, we, you should be in the synagogue or whatever. It's like, no, no, mm -hmm. gotta be out reaching people, you know, whether it's a leper that is healing or whether it's the woman at the well. And I think those are important stories. And I truly believe, um, I truly believe that does, that did make your dad a better person. Like I just, agree from, with you. Just, just from talking to you right now, it feels like you have that hope and you have that faith and I have that hope and faith for you. So I, by the grateful. way, I'm going to keep in my, I'm going to keep in my <laughs> prayers and, uh, we'll, uh, I'll keep reaching out to you every now and then after this podcast. I'm honored, but if I may really quickly, yeah. you didn't make me uncomfortable at all. Um, I really do hope that, you know, the experiences I've gone through with my dad and our family in general, I want to talk about it. I really do. I want to talk about it to people who are hopefully find it, um, inspirational and find some sort of like hope in that story. I feel like all of us come from different backgrounds. And if we feel very comfortable just being open and being vulnerable, especially to crowds of millions or just to one person, um, we go through what we go through for a reason. So I wasn't uncomfortable in the least. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I thank you that I didn't make you uncomfortable. Um, is there, is there a certain film that like last question I'm going to have on that topic, but is there a certain film that you look at and you're like, wow, this relates to my life so much. A certain film that relates to my life so much. Yeah, like you just watch it and like, you could either have like uh, a, a breakdown sobbing, or you could just be cheerful or like you get goosebumps. Is there a certain film that relates to your life that you've seen in theaters or on demand? Oof, you're good at this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <clears throat> A certain film that i relate to could be a character too if you want if you, is there a certain like character that you relate to the most i i gotta be completely honest with you i don't really have a like decent solidified question of that i feel like no, that's fine most films that we watch were inspired by whatever the characters are going through um I'm a very emotional person, so, <laughs> so all of them. <laughs> oh, yeah, pretty much. I'm like, oh, that poor boy on the baseball team. That <laughs> poor dog. That no. <laughs> oh my gosh! Yeah, um, I like to find. Sorry about that. I like to find uh, pieces of myself in different films, uh, where they're not. They'd be sci-fi, drama, comedy. Um, but is there one specific film? No. No. Okay. I can answer that truthfully. <laughs> um, so you, you talked about earlier that you didn't go to, you went to schooling for a little bit for uh, acting, correct? Uh, so for it, film production. For film production. So when you went for film production, did you always want to like, were you, were you interested on more than just the acting part then? Or was acting that something that came later? Like take us through your process on that too. <laughs> You know, for me, and I'll use my life as a quick example. I went Please. from I went from writing in elementary school all the way through middle school. I wanted to be a writer. Then I went mm -hmm. to a robotics camp for like a summer. It's like, oh, I'm going to be like a technician or behind the scenes or something. I was like, okay. And then I was like, oh, I just that's want cool. to direct. And now that's where I'm at now. I'm like, okay. But you use a little bit of both from each. Like you take from different categories, and you it's it's kind of like it's funny how life kind of brings you in all situations where like you can take a one little moment from five years ago. And connected mm. to what you're doing now and it's like okay this can be used in this project and it's like okay now i know how to do this gives you like a, a hat to take with you that you can wear whenever you need it yes. <laughs> um i i originally was uh accepted to palm beach atlantic for uh theater 
<clears throat> theater and drama. But I guess in my mind, <laughs> within two days of being accepted to the theater department there, I had said, I'm actually going to switch over to film production. And uh, my mom was asking me, she's like, what do you mean? You've wanted to be an actor. Was like, why? I told her, I was like, well, I feel like the best way to be prepared in front of the camera is to know what the heck is happening behind it. Um, you know, being on set and just being clueless about what depth of field is or where boom is going to be or what your, you know, what your key light is or why a director is asking you to stop on one mark and not on the other. It's like knowing what is happening behind the camera helps people behind the camera help you in front of the camera. <laughs> so um, I studied film production for two years and gained even more of an, of an appreciation for, you know, the gaffer or um, the, the costume designers or the second AD you know, the, the PA is <laughs> running and grabbing you coffee. I'm, I'm pretty sure it was a decent decision because, you know, like I said, it really does give me such a high regard for the people that really do spend most of their lives unseen while still working to make some of the movies that, you know, we hold very, very close to us. So that was my, uh, that was my process, <laughs> but yeah. Now I, I, I have some films here that I do want to talk about that you started. Um, but the, probably the film I don't have on this list is what was your first ever film that you were in and what was the feeling like? My first ever film that was in. <laughs> I whipped up this now are you are you talking about like a professional production oh, or just professional i mean the first time you stepped on a set and did it and then because because i i do have a, i do have a question that i thought would be interesting to answer but i i won't ask you that now but i i want your reaction okay. uh for okay. like the first ever production <laughs> um one of them was uh it was being directed by a senior at uh, palm beach atlantic uh I remember I was on set and I was, I was friends with the director. Uh, <laughs> uh, he, I guess one of the actors didn't show up and um, he asked me, he was like, uh, how quickly can you memorize these lines? I was like, why? <laughs> He's like, run, go change and come back. I was like, oh, okay. So <laughs> I, I ran to my dorm room and uh, changed and came back to set. And I wound up doing the part <laughs> for, for the, the actor who wasn't there. Um, and it was like a little small role. I guess I was, a, um, <clears throat> I was like the manager of a wrestler uh, in the locker room, just upset that things weren't going very well in the ring. And yeah, that was that was interesting. That was the first time in like an actual professional, you could say professional set, you know. Um, but yeah, that was it <laughs> in college. And, and then, um, so what came first then? Was it a tender flower or was it a soldier's blessing? Uh, which came first? Uh, yes. Soldier's blessing. Okay. In Soldier's Blessing, um, which Chase Hewlett, for everybody that doesn't know Chase, you can go back and watch my podcast with him. Um, but He's amazing. I mean, that dude's talented. He's very talented. I, like I, the way he writes, I'm just beside and, myself. And I, <laughs> and I know we can't talk about it a lot, and I know he'll be watching. But uh, I do have to ask you about the upcoming film. But we we can't spoil too much of that with the with the script. Okay. Um, but so let's let's talk about a soldier's blessing. First of all, we know how you met Chase a little bit. You did reference about you met Chase by being at Full Sail University and living around Full mm -hmm. Sail. Um, but what drew you to that script when you looked at it the first time? And did you expect, like, did you, did he tell you like, Hey, I'm, I'm casting for the lead character here. I'm casting for the, the others, like which soldier. And, um, you, boy, I, I really wish, and I, and I, and I keep telling Chase, I was like, I want him. I know he's, I know he's trying to put it in a film festival, but I really want him to show it to the public. I think the public will love this film. Um, I'm so honored you saying that, but I know he's just equal, like equally as honored, like, he's so proud of that film and I'm so happy that he's proud of that film because, you know, we as a team collectively made something like that. And I'm grateful. I didn't think that, that I didn't expect that to happen, but I guess to answer your question, um, their full sale puts out 
uh, audition, like castings <clears throat> on their Facebook page. They have a Facebook page specifically for castings at Full Sail. Um, and I read it and <laughs> to be very, very blunt, I was like, well, that looks like or sounds like a character that I somewhat look like. <laughs> so <laughs> why not? Male, mid 20s. Um, you know, the dis dis description was, you know, it was a, a, a war film, inspirational war film. Uh, and I was like, okay, let's try it out. Um, didn't really get my hands on the script until we needed to do the audition with which we did over zoom um as we are now and uh he offered me the role just yeah i gotta like admit like after nine and a half years like it blew my mind i was like oh my gosh i'm in a film i didn't care if it was with full sale students or in hollywood i was just like oh my gosh this is awesome so yeah just because i fit the description <laughs> that's why i picked it out and who was the uh you, it's okay you can rat whoever out maybe it was yourself who was the one that knocked over the sandbag wall that day oh <laughs> um, you kept telling us about that story i was like who, who actually knocked it over did did we knock it over did we i mean you know, so much was happening. I'm not <laughs> when, when you're like, like just so zoned in on, you know, what's happening in the script. You're, you're kind of just like, I don't remember. Also, also I know Chase uh, and, and people watching the film because he's, he spoke about it on the podcast. <laughs> but um, on top of that, he had to do a cut scene because like there was there was a transition when you had the gun and then you didn't have. the Yes. Gun. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I don't <laughs> Yo, I remember um, we had a we had an instant where uh, we had left left the gun, <laughs> um, but that's that's a story for another time. But yeah, we had forgotten that um, you know the gun was in my hand at one point and not in my hand at the other. So we had the, there's this small but somewhat noticeable little <laughs> gut scene where I'm like about to kneel down and um, I like throw my hand over and you just see like this insert of the gun just like popping out of nowhere and just flailing onto the ground uh but yeah <laughs> it's not as noticeable it's just something i notice <laughs> well and i guess like that goes to us to another question i have which is how is how is it looking like so i'm sure you have a different version of the script of how it's going to look like the outcome when you're reading it you're like okay i can see the director maybe doing this shot this yeah. shot and then all of a sudden you're like it looks completely different on screen a, I, I have a problem with this too when I'm doing podcasts, even. You know, I hate my own voice. So I never like to be the same. <laughs> so, so I'm one of those people like, okay, um, I guess people like to put up with it because they listen and they watch. So I was like, okay, that's perfect. But, you know, what was that first time when you saw yourself back on like footage? And like, that's kind of, that was a question I was going to ask you when it was like, what was your first film? And then like, what it looked like when you were watching yourself perform for the first time. But I guess we'll do it for this film, A Soldier's Blessing. Because what was it like sitting there watching the final outcome and being like, okay, this is like, because again, I think it was a really great movie, but what, what, were, what was going through your head? Were you watching it as a film or were you watching it like, oh man, what's coming next? How did he edit this? Chase, if he's listening, that son of a gun, he didn't want any of us really to, <laughs> like any of the talent, which was uh, just the two of us. Like he didn't want us to see any of the dailies or any of the footage, but the first day of shooting, <clears throat> excuse me, I remember I asked him, I was like, can I just, I just want to see what it looks like on the camera. And it was just, you know, m me running onto the trail, uh, the range railroad tracks, goodness gracious, uh, and walking around the rail car. And um, I just wanted to see it. I wanted to see what it looked like. And uh, he let me. And I just remember being like floored. I was like, oh my gosh, like I look like I'm like in a movie. Like this looks like a like a movie. Like this looks like something I could see like in like a theater somewhere. This is so cool. Uh so I was geeking out a bit. Um, not because I thought I was did any kind of great grand performance or whatever. It's just I guess the you always hear in college and at film school, yo, you want that that Hollywood look, that that cinema look, that that movie look. And 
seeing it on i think he was shooting on a sony uh sony a7 a7 III, and he said again um just seeing it just floored me i was like wow first of all this looked nothing like i had expected it to when i was first reading the script and second of all i was just excited to see where it went like in regards to editing and color grading in my mind i was like you know what it, whatever decisions he chooses to make it's still his baby i'm just still really really excited to be a part of it <laughs> it's like this is so cool anyway that's uh, me, me and chase have yeah. two different mindsets i know he <laughs> likes to keep everything hidden from the actors i'm the type of person that, like <laughs> if i ever worked on a marvel or disney film like i feel like it'd be leaked because of me <laughs> no <laughs> I, I, edited, I send it to the actors like even if it's not like audio purposes like i just send them how it looks i'm like oh look yeah. at this like i try to give actors more motivation like so when the day's over and i go back and edit a clip i'll send it back to them and then it gives you more motivation for the next day of filming is how i look at it um true but i would the, imagine that yeah the problem is it's more so like yeah you shouldn't do this on a major production because you might actually get fired <laughs> i was like okay I, i'll keep that in mind thank you <laughs> Just a small piece of advice. You, yes. you may lose your job. <laughs> it's like, uh, oh, who was it? Um, we just had that Spider-Man No Way Home trailer leaked earlier. Right. Early. Mm -hmm. And that's even worse because their name was on the, did you, so they, they know who the person is because each person that gets the trailer, their name's uh -huh. underneath, like, or whatever in the faded thing. It's like, yeah, she lost her job. 100% she lost her job. Yo. <laughs> Which is sad I, to uh, think I, about, but like, I was, you got, you got like a, a, a fame, you got the fame of like 14 million people watching it at least so <laughs> true true i think uh what marvel directors uh used to give this, what pieces of the script that had different endings or different outcomes and if anything leaked they would know like what actor had leaked it because of what they had said because yeah. of their script that they were given um i understand where you're coming from i feel like that's a great motivation for talent but at the same time it was it was exciting it really was exciting. Like I was nervous as hell when, excuse me, I don't, I was nervous as heck <laughs> when I went to, to actually see the film. That was the biggest thing. I, I just was like shaking. I was shaking. <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh. Um, but still it was just as motivating. Yeah. And then a tender flower. Talk a little bit about that one because for me now, I haven't personally seen this film. I know this was a film that Chase had recommended that said, hey. It's two of us. <laughs> That Chase had recommended and said, "Hey, you need to talk about this film." So, it, because I I don't I haven't seen it, I want you to just give a little synopsis on what the film's really about, and then like I guess do your best pitch deal to me. Like, what? Okay. If, if you're pitching that film to me, say I'm a company executive, like what is the film about? Um, two very unlikely friends um, that happened to meet by chance. Uh, learn that each of them have uh, more in common with the other than they first expected, uh, which in reality is pain and darkness in this world. Um, I play, I don't want to say a bum, a uh, displaced uh, homeless person, um, homeless guy. And uh, I wind up meeting a, a young lady who takes me in and uh, I discover that she's living a life that doesn't seem as beautiful and um, just the connection that's built between those two characters, uh, how it evolves and how ultimately he winds up saving her in the way that she had saved him. Uh, so it's a story about compassion um, and fearlessness, I would say, and forgiveness. So it's a great great little script it's just you and i both haven't seen it <laughs> do you do you draw um do you draw any of your characters motivation to your backstory growing up like if you need to let, let's say if you need like a scene where you're gonna cry i'm not somebody that can cry right on the spot um but obviously you know i'm not there for acting i'm just a director that tells you no you need to cry but for you like do you put any of that mindset of, of your personal life into that to make your emotions more heightened for that day on set to really draw yeah. that character. Yeah. Like I said, I'm a very emotional individual. Like I just, in my everyday speech or, you know, speaking with friends or sitting down, having a glass of wine at the end of the night with a buddy of mine, like a very, very emotional person. Um, 
the scene in a soldier's blessing where i'm looking at an old photo um I remember his character is like hyperventilating and he opens up his bible and there's a picture of a, a young girl there didn't know who the heck this girl was <laughs> it's like well there's someone i'm looking at someone's grandmother um but in my mind i remember what moved me so much wasn't pretending that there was you know a, a girl at home that was waiting for me um what really got me was when I started picturing my sister, like it oh, still gets me <laughs> like, yo, um, <clears throat> I haven't seen my sister in uh, like a hot minute. And I feel like we see each other um, just now and then holidays and such. But yeah, I remember just picturing my sister and it just like really got me. <laughs> um, so little like moments like that. Yeah. I think most would, unless you have this physical ability to like make yourself just seem incredibly emotional in like the blink of an eye. But for me, um, I wear my emotions on my sleeve and also on my face. <laughs> so yes, <laughs> to answer your question. <laughs> so a little bit of future work. Um, this is where I want to talk about you playing Satan coming up. All right. Um, so how is that without, obviously without spoilers, how is that, how have you kind of designed, how are you going, excuse me, how are you going to portray mm -hmm. this character or this version? I feel like every time I, I've read, okay, let me, I guess, let me give a backstory before this. So Please. this is Chase Hewlett's new film. Um, I will be coming down to Florida as well to help you guys uh, record this. So party down in Florida. I'll see you down there. Um, <laughs> I'll bring so tequila. I read the script. Can't, can't leak the script. Can't really go in discussion what the script is. I don't even know if we can give a name, so probably can't even do that. Right. But, uh, I can't talk about how you're playing the character Satan. And I know Chase had an interesting view on the character of Satan just throughout yeah. the whole script. So is there somebody that you're going to model the Satan character after? Is there somebody that in the in the film industry can you simply look at somebody and say hey i like how somebody spoke this line of dialogue how somebody portrayed this character is it are you what kind of approach has he talked to you about with like how are you going to deliver lines of dialogue how are you going to deliver um i does that does that kind of make sense I'm yeah sure. yeah I'm how trying, am i crafting I'm trying to see this what the character? motivation is for this character <clears throat> if i may um he initially introduced satan um to me uh in the words <laughs> he's kind of like humphrey Beauregard. <laughs> like he speaks very very firm and very uh he knows what he's saying is is true and he knows what he's saying uh is it's just borderline emotionless you know but um as we're reading the script and we're doing the table reads like I gotta say, hearing Chase now, Chase is an incredible guy through and through. But like his un his understanding of Satan is so, excuse me, is so different than what most people would assume a s Satan to be like in in real life. <laughs> like, if you met Satan, like I feel like most people base it off of like Lucifer and and you know, what they like a guy with a pitchfork and stuff like that but every time we read the script he's he pauses for a moment and he talks about his own understanding of satan and hearing what he has to say about um th there was something he told me about like the real success satan has in interactions with us and our interactions with him is when somebody thinks that satan doesn't exist satan wins that truth there's a there's a victory there for him um and it'll play out in the script actually towards the end of the script uh where you understand that now his writing for satan is very um poetic uh the way he envisions him looking physically is just it's just different than most people would assume uh, in a film involving Satan. Um, but is there anyone I'm modeling him after? I gotta be honest, no. I, him and I had spoken and our, what initially we thought would 
sound like Humphrey Bogart is a lot different now because we've read it together and we've read it with the other cast and in front of the crew. And I told him, I was like, you know what, this is just going to evolve. And he knows that. And he knows that because I'm learning something about Satan every single time I sit down with the script with him because he just has such a powerful understanding of well, yeah, Satan. <laughs> it's amazing. What is the hardest line you ever had to memorize? Was there, was there ever, because I know you talked about like that guy pulled you in, like how fast can you memorize lines? Like, you know, like, and that put you on the spot a little bit, but you know, is there ever a, was there ever a movie or a film that you're just like, okay, this line, I kept tripping up on this line. Um, it, there, it, well, when I was in high school, <laughs> I remember being in a, my first play ever. Uh, <clears throat> and it wasn't so much the, you know, the length of the lines. It was more my understanding of it. I, I was so young and, you know, reading this murder mystery play, I just, in my mind, I was looking at the script and I was like, I don't understand like what this character is thinking. Like, uh, like I don't get it. <laughs> like the way he speaks, because he was like this nut job who everybody assumes killed this person in, in the house. And um, I just remember thinking, you know, it's not the length of the lines. I'm just like confused. I don't know where this character is getting most of <laughs> these words or these thoughts. Like what is happening? Um, so yeah, I would say I rem Christopher Wren was the name of the character <laughs> the mouse trap i remember that entire script just i, I was so confused <laughs> um but yeah that was probably the most difficult i feel like uh, now that i'm older i'll read a script and you know even though, though the lines seem complicated i still have a deeper i have a higher emotional intelligence now to understand where characters are coming from with the words that they're choosing to say <laughs> yeah so how do you go about the lines of marketing yourself now, because I know you talked about building up a reel earlier in the, in the podcast, in the, excuse me, earlier in the podcast. So is there a certain social media tool that you use or do you try to keep everything updated? Like, how do you market yourself for everybody else to find you? Right now, <laughs> like in the, in this moment, in this instance, yes, in this instance. Or, I... or future plans too, because like this can relate a little bit to, <clears throat> to goals, like future goals. Obviously, the goal is to continue to work on films or continue to be working at bars because, quite frankly, I mean, I, I'm not – listen, barring, you can make a lot of money. <laughs> listen, if you are a good bartender, you can make a lot of money. So I, I applaud. Um, but, like, so what's the future goals and how do you want to continue to upgrade your social media or your reels or put all this together? Like, what's the end game? Give me about, give me about three things you would like to touch on within the next 10 years. Um. I'd like to continue building up relationships, strong relationships with people who are both associated with the films that I've been that I've worked on now um, and that I plan on working on. <clears throat> uh, because the, we're talking about young Hollywood directors, we're talking about young Hollywood screenwriters, we're talking about uh, Netflix original film screenplay screenwriter. You know, like these are incredible people that are being pumped out of the school and they're both incredibly talented but they're also incredible individuals just to chill and hang out with so maintaining decent relationships with them not just for you know career reasons but i feel like we all can learn something from each other um so that um i will be continuing to work at you know as a bartender uh, but I'm just building up my reel right now. Um, I'm not really marketing myself. I'm making connections and I'm making friends. And what a blessing that those friends just happen to be in the film industry and incredibly talented. And we can hang out and grab a beer. <laughs> so uh, I'd like to get an agent eventually. Um, see where that goes. Actually, as opposed to an agent, more of a, a manager, I feel like. Um, the relationship between talent and manage, like an, a manager is a little more personal than talent and an agency, you know? Uh, if I may, my friend, I, I know that this is, 
I'm assuming this is live or recorded, but um, it's being recorded. Yeah. So you. My, if any, by the way, if there's anything you need me to edit out that you didn't like, I will edit it out. It's fine. No, no, you're okay. But um, my camera is blinking at me with the not much battery left. But I, oh, I'm okay. using I'm using my Canon, but I can still switch it over to my computer <laughs> camera okay. if you need me to. <laughs> um, but we can we can do a quick wrap up. Let me. Let me just uh, first of all, networking. I want to talk on. I want to touch on that real quick to everybody that's listening. Networking is what you were trying to say is one of the most important things that we can do in this industry. I agree. Um, and I want to say thank you first of all, Christian, for joining me. Oh, I'm and, honored. <laughs> and I hope that we continue. Listen, I'll have you back on the podcast here in the future, and uh, I'll see you behind the scenes and down on set at Chase's film down in Florida. Uh, come early next year. I'm so excited. <laughs> so, uh, Christian, where can people find you at to reach out or connect with you? Facebook, Instagram, um, really more so my Instagram, uh, which is just Christian Salmonson. That's it. <laughs> Christian Salmonson, everybody. Thank you, Christian, for joining me again. This is Hope Speaks Podcast on the Shield of Hope channel. Thank you, guys. Blessed. Thank you. Thank you.